Pre Podcast. We've got Reggie today. We're lucky to be joined by Eileen, who's yes. been a nurse in radiology, but more than just radiology, I've been a nurse in general for many, many years, and we'll talk about that. Thank you, Eileen, for joining us today. Yes, we're very happy to have you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And today we're kind of covering the subject of uh, radiology nursing. What do they do? What services do they provide? What value do they bring? So Eileen, we'll let you just kind of take it from there. Um, So I've been in radiology just specifically uh, for 15 years, but over the last almost 40 years, I've been in in and out of radiology, but the last 15 years specifically in radiology. And I noticed that a lot of healthcare people really had no idea what the heck we did in radiology. (laughs) So I just took it upon myself just to put a little... um, information together just to give, especially nurses in the healthcare profession, just a little information of what we do down there, just to give them a little glimpse of what uh, radiology nursing does. Nice. Now, you didn't want to keep it as like the best kept secret in the hospital? Um, no, because a lot of nurses, believe it or not, when the radio, when we have float uh, pool nurses come to radiology, they mm-hmm. end up working as a radiology she nurse because they go, this is great. Yeah, right. We want to do this too. So right. most of our nurses that we, new nurses that we get, we get them from, um, we get them from the float pool. Nice. So wow. yeah, I hear a lot of positive feedback from the nurses that we work with. Yeah. Um, seems like they really enjoy their position. Yeah. It's a, it's a fun place to work. It's interesting. It's so, not just fun. It's very interesting. Right. I guess you say a lot of people are confused by what is exactly that you do so what are some of the most common questions that you get maybe from other nurses right i I think a lot of people get uh ct and mri confused they they go what's the difference isn't it the same thing right they get contrast confused um they think you don't you get that warm feeling with mri contrast um they get they wonder why do we have to start specific ivs for uh for For radiology Um, they go they don't understand about um, they say well do I have to take my earrings off for a CT and I go no it's different than an MRI you know CT if we're doing a CT of your head yes you have to take your earrings off but if we're doing a CT of your abdomen no if we're doing a MRI of your abdomen yes all every all your metal has to come off no metal in the room for right. MRI no metal in the scan for CT right so that's the difference and I try to uh, educate patients as well as um, as nurses now when it comes to being a radiology nurse you get to touch a lot of the modalities right not just like MRI CT but right. like like how many nuke modalities med. Do you oh actually ultrasound work in? nuke med oh, wow. um, breast Good. imaging um what IR. Else do I, wow well ir i did in the past but ir is a separate in our facility uh ir is a separate nurses okay. ir mm. cath lab used but i used to do that in the past oh wow yeah, so that just to give people an years. example of the size of your facility about how many beds would you say oh there's like 300 Plus, beds right? in our facility yeah, and growing, yeah. Right? i think yeah. that's yeah. oh it's good growing goes. in leaps and bounds yeah, yeah you can't keep sure. up <laughs> yeah <laughs> right. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, so a day to day with the different exams, different biopsies and procedures that we do, what would you say that you mostly have your hand in with? with the different um, well, we do a lot of ultrasound biopsies, uh, transplanted organ biopsies, paracentesis, wow. thoracentesis. Um, we did a lot of CT biopsies. And if you don't mind, just for the viewers listening, what exactly would, can you just kind of quickly break down what exactly would a a paraorthoracentesis? Okay, a paraorthoracentesis, uh, um, it could be from organ failure, like liver uh, disease causes uh, fluid buildup in the abdomen, or it could be from... um, cancer, a lot of uh, ovarian, you know, that kind of uh, cancer or liver cancer causes fluid to build up into the abdomen and it's in Uh the abdominal area. And so fluid, it could be anywhere from a few hundred cc's to thousands of cc's of fluid. The most fluid I have seen taken off is 19 liters of fluid wow. that we have taken off of somebody, somebody's abdomen. 19 liters oh, of fluid is, like 50 plus pounds? is like five gallons of fluid. Ooh. 
yeah. five oh, okay. gallons That's a good of reference. fluid. And just how that translates to imaging is it's basically a patient with ascites and so patients oh ascites, ascites is the yeah. word for it yeah yes. and so these patients for mr that I, we can speak for they don't image very well right they're more susceptible to artifacts so therefore we have to bring them on a smaller magnet so we put them on the one five right typically they're bloated they're in a lot of discomfort it's hard for them to hold still for as long as we need them to and to hard to lay flat yeah right. it is extremely hard for them to yeah. lay flat and because all that fluid moves up and it compresses their lungs and you get right. these patients that you know they have a need for these drains like weekly well, yeah exactly sometimes twice a week yeah sometimes, wow yeah sometimes wow. twice a week so if you could time their imaging to be post you know you're you're able to get you're better pictures better, that way yes yeah. better position yeah and for so sure. that's a paracentesis and that's the draining of the fluid that's builds up in your abdomen so what it would be a thoracentesis the same thing but in the chest cavity okay so, so ascites versus pleural effusion I yeah yeah i got a quick question too so radiology nursing is more of like an outpatient type of nursing because we work in a hospital but it's more so uh is it more environments like when you say um but a store some thesis, is that an outpatient procedure that you're doing or would that normally be done in a hospital? Um, so it used, it is a, an outpatient, it can be an outpatient Patient. procedure, but we can oh, do okay. it on, of course, inpatients as well. Right. Um, the, um, it, it's a quick procedure. There's no sedation involved. Oh, All nice. it is oh, is local. Yeah. It's just cleaning and a local, you know, we use lidocaine. We use buffered lidocaine, which is a lot nicer than just straight lidocaine. Oh, really? Buffered lidocaine? Buffered lidocaine, lidocaine huh. is a lot nicer because it puts a little, um, we use uh, sodium, bicarb. sodium bicarb and it oh. doesn't sting as much. Oh, nice. So it kind of just smooths out that sting. It's right in there, yeah. And, um, and you just put a catheter in, similar to an IV catheter, goes into the spot and I used to work in you know on the floor in an outpatient you know in a clinic setting and they did thoracentesis just in an exam room oh, without uh, ultrasound oh, uh, they did tap 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 and found the lowest spot and cleaned off the, the area and stuck the needle in you know wow. in an, just a and outpatient. then are you meant to observe the patient afterwards for nope, a, thor they, a pneumothorax or and uh, pneumothorax after a thoracentesis is rare, but it can happen. Okay. Because okay. you're not in the lung, you're in the the chest cavity, so you're not really, uh, but you can hit the And do lung. they usually Especially. access it like from a different direction, lateral, anterior, posterior, uh, or is posterior. it just very, okay. It's always posterior. Okay. Yes. Is there a reason for that? Less because likely for a pneumo? less likely for a pneumo. Okay. Yeah. Now, I know you mentioned uh, kind of how things were done then and how things are being done now. Now, have you seen, I can imagine you've seen a lot of change in your career just in maybe like even IV technology, right? Oh, IV technology. Oh, my gosh. We used to, um, years ago, when you started an IV, you, when you once you got into the vein, you took the IV, the needle part of the IV out of the vein to mm -hmm. advance the plastic catheter in, and you had a three-inch long needle that oh, you put wow. down on the your surface. So you had this long needle. Wow. That's why a lot of healthcare workers used to get poked with the dirty needle. Oh, so geez. now you have safety needles that, right. you know, it's either uh, manual or like uh, release, automatic like action or something. that yeah. goes back into. So that was a big, that's a big change. Wow. Yes. So in your years of experience, have you ever been stuck by a dirty needle? Um, I haven't been stuck by a dirty needle, but I was stuck with a dirty scalpel. Really? Uh, but it was not that so like was, it worse you had one to choose from <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> it was it was back in the 80s I guess that by and dirty it, axe <laughs> oh it was in my finger and it oh. was a 80 something year old in the 80s so. oh, okay cool I, I felt pretty safe <laughs> so, so unfortunate it was a little old lady nice. right? <laughs> so with you said with the other nurses and other uh you know uh, workers within the hospital you get a lot of questions about what's the difference between CT and MRI. What would be some of the other questions you would get? Um, so like they, let's see, um, you know, with ultrasound, like, well, why do they need an ultrasound? Why, why can't they do, oh, CT and MRI is like a big thing. Why can't they just do 
a CT to look at a uh, damaged knee. Oh, and I said, well, CT can't really look at soft tissue as well as yeah. a MRI. MRI is better at looking at soft tissue. Right. CT is better at looking at the bone. Right. So are these questions that you're getting from other nurses or from the actual ordering physician, though? Oh, no, no, not from the physician. No, okay. I'm glad I don't get that from the physician. <laughs> oh, my so God. I'm, curious, I'm curious why the <laughs> nurses would be asking those questions, though. No, A lot of times they put the orders in for the physicians, too, right? No, no, it's just like, like they're just wondering why uh, would okay. they do this test over that? Right. Yeah. You know, okay. Why don't they just do a quick CT? Oh, yeah. uh, right. Yeah. Right. Makes sense. Because um, have you seen a lot of uh, job openings in the radiology nursing sector? In our in our facility, uh, if a job opens up, it's filled very quickly right. because it's a a popular position. Because they heard about me and Reggie, right? <laughs> yes. They want to get invited onto the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, was, I just I'm just interested to kind of has radiology nursing always been around or is it one of those things that just, there's a gradual need for it? Uh, when I uh, years ago, I worked in radiology at another facility and this is back in 1991. Mm -hmm. There were two radio. We were uh, special procedure nurses, basically radiology. And we worked in a big facility and there was two of us. Oh, wow. So we did um, special procedures if anybody needed, you know, CT. Right. And I, I don't ever remember going to MRI now that I think of it, though. Right. But that was back in 90s. So oh, right. wasn't a lot there wasn't yeah, yeah. a lot. I, I think so. Radiology has come a long way. A long way. Nice. Big time. Things are changing drastically, yeah. especially on our end. So I can only imagine as a nurse. Yeah. Seeing all that change, too, because okay. even the electronic health record, right? Like even how we're recording things and things are kind of getting passed around now from hospital to hospital. Yes. I think it's been amazing. Right? Oh, definitely. How's that kind of. Oh, health care. Let yeah. me tell you. Wait, uh, I'm going to blow your mind here. I mean, <laughs> health care has changed. I mean, back in the 80s, we used to smoke in ICU at the nurse's yeah. station. The nurse's station oh, was wow. so heard this big with a monitor, not a computer. There were no computers with the in ICU and we had the EK kg at the monitor and there was a patient 10 feet away on a respirator and we would smoke at the desk when wow. we say we so funny. the nurses and the doctors <laughs> the doctors smoked at the bedside yeah. wow i've heard these stories so like there's some mr right? techs yeah. that used yeah. to smoke there in the control room. wow yeah so yeah. so yes healthcare has come along <laughs> yeah, <regulation>. thankfully <laughs> thankfully <laughs> So, so, uh, so when you talk about nurses who start off as a float or whatever, and they didn't really have experience in radiology before, but then afterwards they really like it. Do you, do you notice that there's any, cause you know, we're coming from an MR perspective. So do you notice that there's a lot of fear as far as MR safety goes? I, yes. They I go, notice a lot of oh like my uncertainty when I see yeah. in their eyes. <laughs> or too much comfort. Uh, that it, it's one or the other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, the other. that's true. If they have too much comfort. Yes. Um, so this, I, this, my little PowerPoint, um, I have also sent to the float pool also that they have a little, and it was a little idea of what we do in radiology. And it was also to help them with the IVs too. Oh, nice. To help them. Oh yeah. That David was, got that up. Nice. To help with the IVs and to, you know, to, that they will, uh, do a better job at starting IVs and that we would have less infiltrations because infiltrations in i in radiology is serious especially, well, especially in ct because they can large doses right? large doses in a very short time Ooh. under right. very high psi so right. we were talking about that yeah we we're definitely especially. going to cover that one thing that i actually had a question about oh and this this one here a lot of people especially patients will say but I already had a CAT scan of my abdomen and pelvis at a different facility, or I already had a brain MR right. at a different facility. So this says we have 250 different MR protocols. Yep. We have 150 different protocols just for MR brain. Right. 150 exactly. brain MR protocols. So they may have had a MR brain somewhere else. But it, it might not be of the trigeminal nerve or, uh, right. or what, you know, whatever that protocol might exactly. be. Exactly. So yeah. they go, well, why am I having this one again? So right. this also kind of helps with, yeah. you know, those kinds of questions for patients. For too. sure. Yeah. And, you know, CT, we have five, 500 different CT protocols and we have right. 78 different ones for ab abdomen and pelvis. 
<laughs> so that, you know, there's a lot of different, you know, protocols that we use and we have a lot of specific, you know, yeah. at our facility, we do a lot of specific For protocols. Sure. Very, <laughs> very light. And when you say protocol, so you, cause we have our oh. imaging protocol and then as a radiology nurse, you guys have like your actual, like maybe some kind of IV size protocol. Yes. Or, yeah. IV uh, protocols and medication protocols. Right. And, you know, there's, um, protocols for, you know, specific, um, specific, uh, let's see, rules of what we need to do to get the patient ready for, uh, for oh. an exam. Oh, right. So they need to, um, they need to have a, uh, this size of an IV. They right. need to have, uh, fluids before the exam. They oh, need true. to have this medication. Right. They need to have an IV in this arm. Oh. They need to have uh, labs drawn for this reason. Oh. Yeah. They need yeah. to have exactly. They need to have labs, um, okay. you know, and make sure that their kidney function is okay. Right. right. So there's a lot of, and protocols, I mean, before, you know, it's, it's, you know, specific information that you need to know before, uh, this patient is ready for their exam. For the test. Yeah. And that, yeah. Nice. And that goes a long way. Cause you guys are definitely like the first line of defense. Cause you guys usually see the patient before we do. Yes. And when, when you do have a good radiology nurse, it's, it's just so seamless that transition and the patients already have those questions answered about, Oh, are they going to use this? You know, in direct coil, or, you know, things like that. And, you know, because there's so many questions that that people have. They anticipate these exams, especially MRI. So it's, it's great to have someone in the chair like you, Eileen, that can really kind of really talk to them about this kind and of And you stuff chose the endorectal through. coil as a reference. <laughs> well, let me tell you the first time I heard endorectal coil, and I right. told this to your manager and supervisor, the first time I heard that my image of an endorectal coil was a bed spring. Ooh. And I thought, this is what they put up oh to the prostate yeah. endorectal coil and your supervisor laughed so hard she goes <laughs> i'm not going to get that image out of my head now <laughs> oh that's so true <laughs> because I, uh, I, I mean get closer to the prostate you got to put a coil in there right. and it's a bed spring <laughs> <laughs> right exactly for uh, those of you at home like wondering what in the world we're talking about <laughs> 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 whenever we do an mri of a prostate we use a coil uh an antenna, if you will that's uh designed to be inserted into the rectum of the patient so right endo which means inside the rectum of the patient endo rectal coil so yeah bring that up I, dave if you would <laughs> pull up a picture that's what the endo rectal coil looks like and if you're wondering what the what the size is to scale um what could we use as a reference? Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't want to get into this too much. Right. Uh, Let's just say it's wanna... like a hot dog. Yeah. <laughs> and a multiple... hot dog is a good, <laughs> yeah. a good reference. There's multiple coils out there. But too, coil is and... just, an, I, 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 then, I then learned that a coil is just another term of, of a piece of equipment to to put closer to the body right. part to get a better image in MRI. Exactly. It's an antenna. It's a radio antenna. Your antenna. Yeah. yeah. Ex so that's a better frequency. Yes. Yeah. So sorry, I digress. Yeah, no, that's perfect. No, <laughs> this is great. It's so we're actually lucky enough to be joined by Eileen, who's the most prepared patient, or excuse me, guest yes. we've ever had. Yes, <laughs> she's brought a PowerPoint, and so we'll kind of go over the PowerPoint. Um, we went over the endorectal coil. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Did you bring that up, like screen on screen? Okay. Uh, yeah, let's do this, and then does she have control that she can with the slides that she can change? Oh my bad. Yeah, so CT and a lot of CT and MR, the contrast, like people are like, oh, well, I have an allergy to iodine. Oh, my gosh. So I'm, I'm definitely allergic to to MRI. And I, you know, it, they're, it's like apples and oranges. They're, it's not even the same. CT is iodine. Gadolinium is oh. totally different. Right. You That's know, a question we get a lot. Right. Yeah. So then there are two separate um things on your periodic table right. of elements the and i even metals, have right, yeah. there's an if you do like the there's another if you hit like the nope go back there's like um i have like a the transitions next, nope go back there's like transitions oh well let's there's, show her real quick how yeah, she, you actually have control over it I yeah, mean, so you can, is, uh, now i have like little 
Yeah, like that. The On the other one, there was another transition. Like it had like uh, the elements for CT and MR. Uh, oh, it's not CT oh, for oh, gadolinium oh. and iodine. There's like uh, the um, go back right there. Like iodine is whatever. I guess there's nothing on that one. Okay, maybe I didn't send the right one. So, um, you know, iodine is an element and so is gadolinium and about 3% of the population is allergic to iodine where only 0.1 of the population is allergic to gadolinium. So, and what would a reaction be? So 99% of the time, if somebody has an allergic reaction, it's hives, little kind of looking mosquito bites that they might have on. Yeah, And that's usually the kind of allergic reactions that we have. Very rarely somebody has a more severe allergic reaction where they mm -hmm. stop breathing or they have respiratory, you know, they have swelling in their throat or they have a more severe reaction. So, and what would that be called? Uh, anaphylaxis. I've experienced it once. Have you? Uh, we have experienced it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Are you so. experienced it as an actual person? Or as, as a, a as a, uh, like, a tech scanning a patient, oh, your patient yeah. where I injected yeah. and oh, they okay. experience anaphylaxis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we see that more in in, in CT. CT. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, but rarely you ever see that in MRI. So, and actually, one of the reasons why we have IV access instead of doing a butterfly is for that reason alone. So we have immediate access and right. give in just in case. Because a lot right. of people ask, "Why are we doing an IV? Can you just butterfly it?" Right. It's a question we get often. And that that's a good. That's a good reason that you have IV access afterwards, just in case, because yes, if they have anaphylaxis, I tell patients, you know, especially for CT, they're sneezing, they're coughing, they're saying there's something wrong right on the table as they're injecting. That's right. how fast it's just, it happens. Oh, so, if you're, so time is crucial at that point, because yes. if that airway closes up, then it's yep. just, oh yeah. It's, it's fast. It's fast. Yes. Oh, it's crazy. So that's on the MRI. Then I was trying to explain that I think on the next one, it's like. So the, if you don't mind, I interrupted. Sorry. But for just before we leave that topic, so for patients who do are presented to you with a reaction after exam and it may be hives or whatever, what would you do in that okay. event? Okay, so hives, we look, you know, if they have like four hives, we give them uh, fluid. I always have them empty their bladder because all the contrast is in their bladder. Oh, right. I mean, within before they get off the table, the right. contrast is in their bladder. That's right. how fast it goes through your system. Ooh. Kidneys are amazing. Right. So I have them empty their bladder to get most of that contrast out of their system. And then we give them PO fluids, lots of oral fluids to flush mm -hmm. their system out. And then if it's more hives, we might give them IV fluids. If they have a driver, we might give them Benadryl. If they don't have a driver and it's not bad, we will give them, um, you know, Allegra or, you know, some kind oh, of yeah. uh, stuff that's non-drowsy medication. Right. Also, not that they have that option. That way, if yes. they have to get a hospital stay and things like that because of something like this. So that's all I mean, if it's bad, I mean, we will stay, go, right? you know, Salumedrol maybe first which is, you know, right. a uh, steroid medication through their IV. Ooh. We haven't done that in a long time, well, thank God. Right? And then the if it's here. really <laughs> bad, they would get epinephrine, adrenaline oh, oh, yeah. through their IV or, you and know, sub-Q. At that point, the cold blue button that's, crashed, right? That's, you know, the EpiPen. EpiPen now we have yeah. EpiPens on yeah. all of our crash carts. And um, <clears throat> I haven't done, well, not since we had EpiPen. I haven't, I've never done that. Thank God. <laughs> but, um, you know, we have that on all our crash carts. Wow, but you nice. can also do IV epi, epi also. Oh, nice. Okay. Adrenaline. Yeah. Perfect. Wow. So. Yeah, that's, I mean, that, so you, you've got to be pretty versatile, sounds like, to be a radiology nurse. Yeah, right. and we're all advanced cardiac life support trained. Oh, nice. So we all have uh, ACLS ACL. nice. training. So we do know emergency um, And you've steps. got a background in cath lab too, right? Cath so lab. And, and my background before that is ICU. Yeah. Oh, nice. <clears throat> so is, is that kind of one of those recommendations before you go to radiology? Is it is radiology nursing entry level or is it more like an advanced nursing, would you say, like? Maybe where you would kind of find yourself after you had that ICU experience and that cath lab experience. Um, most radiology nurses have a lot of background before they get to radiology. Nice. Is the history. Cool. I need. Yeah, no, before. Nice. 
So. <laughs> so you say you've done IC, you've done cath lab, you've done radiology. Obviously, it sounds like you like radio- radiology a lot. But where have you found the most fulfillment, I guess? Um, when I was in interventional radiology, I thought that was very cool when you gave contrast, especially to when you were doing like carotids or oh, a head. Yeah. And you watch somebody talking on a fluoro and you saw, (laughs) you know, a a skeleton talking on fluoro. I just thought that was so cool. Right. But I learned a lot in IR when you watched, you know, systems and you could see contrast going through and watching the functionality (laughs) kind of play out in real time. Yeah, in real time. I thought that was very, very cool. Right. Yeah. So I learned a lot in IR. Nice. Cool. But I kind of put it all together when I came to radiology and then saw all the different modalities nice yeah so we've covered some of the questions that you get and it sounds like you get a lot so what's the difference between ct and mri what's the difference between the contrast itself do you get other common questions too with the nurses or ordering physicians or whoever or just friends and family um well then this next slide i go i could see why people get these mixed up ct and mri machines themselves they look very, very similar. And, you know, they're just two big, you know, donut shaped machines. And um, so I try to explain to them, you know, a CT is the one that, you know, you're only on the table, you know, 10 minutes, Real quick, 15 yeah. minutes, there's no noisy clanging machine, you know, sound. Right. And, oh, this thing is driving me crazy. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but MRI, you're kind of more in a tube, inside the tube. Are, are there more nursing protocols for CT or more nursing protocols for MRI, would you say? Um, would you I mean, yeah. It's kind of tough, right? <clears throat> That's tough, yeah. Because um, I feel like with MRI, we have a few protocols that need a certain like IV size, maybe like a perfusion and things like that or it might be a CT, urogram ct there's a lot right is there a chance yeah. where you ever have to put in like a smaller ivy like a 24 22 gauge mostly and they're CT? all pretty big right no, they're all big yeah. right usually big yeah and with uh mri there's urograms you might have to get set up for a lasix or something like that i bet you can do the same thing with ct C- but, correct uh, yeah so there's similar so there's a lot of translation there i would imagine i yeah. see yeah So, um, you know, and the biggest thing is no, like the difference with CT and MRI, no metal in the picture for CT, no metal in the room for MRI. So that, that, you know, I think is the big distinction. Yeah. And then I, you know, I showed them the pictures. There's lots of similarity with the pictures. You know, if you just look at a picture, you know, you get, um, you may not be able to tell, you know, if that's a CT or MRI, MRI picture, if you're not, you know, like familiar, yeah. especially an abdomen. I mean, look at those abdomen pictures, you know, those right. are very similar. I remember so. training for MRI <clears throat> and, uh, you know, kind of when we were reviewing cross-sectional anatomy, it all looked the same to me, except for just on a course where it just looks like right. white, you know, right. that's just white sketch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to the sound again. We love you guys. Well, and you just mentioned cross sectional anatomy. That's probably by far the biggest similarity, right? Right. For CT and MR, yeah. Is with X ray, it's not. With this, it's, it's cross sectional anatomy. Straight so. cross sectional, which just means it's, it's multiple planes that we're looking at the sagittal coronal axial planes or uh, transverse. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I can totally relate and I can understand how people can get those things mixed up because they kind of look similar. Mm-hmm. They have the same kind of scanner kind of look. But uh, they're drastically different, right? Yeah. And I explain to patients what a cross-section uh, piece is. Like if you take a loaf of raisin bread and you cut it down oh, nice. and you go, then you could see your raisins. You could see a little swirl of, you know, cinnamon. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can see the inside of your loaf. And that's what we're doing to the we inside make of their body. graphic like that. <laughs> Make raisin bread and do yeah. all the transactions. <laughs> if you could actually bring in raisin bread for that, yeah. <laughs> Little butter. Great <laughs> yes. Eileen's a great cook, by the way. <laughs> so the, you know, I'm just trying to explain, just so they have a visual in their head, like what is the difference. So you put apples and oranges together just to look at the difference. Look at the brain. Right. I mean, the brain right next to each other. I don't think, it, I think a trained person would have a hard time picking out what is the difference between a CT and MRI. Right. Exactly. So. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons why the radiologists get paid such good money because they have to take it to that next level and find out not only 
why they're different, but and understand, uh, you know, how that affects the, um, you know, the anatomy and the, um, what am I trying to say? They're like pathology and stuff, right? Because CT is going to present a certain pathology differently. Yeah, she's, uh, she's got an example of pathology at the bottom. There. Yeah. So, hemangioma on the left is CT. Hemangioma on the right is an MR scan. By the way, I've got a huge hemangioma on my liver. So. Oh, my. Yeah. Hey, can get that biopsy. Just a little fun fact for the day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my. Yeah, yeah. I used to think, you know, radiologists had it easy right. they just sit around they look at pictures that's in the old days with the pictures up on the <laughs> right. on the screen oh, right, yeah, right. <laughs> so i used to think you know so a cardiologist just has to know the heart uh, a neurologist just, the heart. just has to know the brain <laughs> right. you know a urologist just the urinary system right. but a radiologist has to know oh, everything and, and they have late. to know every little nerve yeah. artery every little they have to know everything. Right. So when I came to radiology, I realized radiologists are super it's, smart. It's so impressive, right? <laughs> they are. I mean, and I've, they been, are. I've been doing MRI for, I would say a while now, like almost eight, maybe nine years. And there's certain things that I can pick up. And and to, to my esteem, I, I consider myself a very good kind of like lesion finder type of technologist. Oh, um, so... There's rads out there that, I mean, this is these very minute, like, discreet oh. changes. And you don't see that first, but then after them revealing, I'm like, oh, yeah. That, yes. That, Isn't that, is that, a, that shadow? Oh, and it's like, yeah. I did not it's, see it's that. It's such an expertise. It's amazing. They have the, yeah, the gift of observation, I guess, the skills. Right. Actually, I've got a great radiologist story. They're a visionary. Quick, it's a quick okay. one. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Shout out to Poya if you're listening. I won't say your last name, but Dr. Poya. Dr. Poya. One time we had, in the MR department, Zone 3, actually, we had moved a, a uh, frame picture in 8 by 10 from like one side of the room to the other side of the room. Something that would go unnoticed by everybody who walked through the room, except for the radiologist. He walks through the room and it had only been changed for about an hour. <laughs> and he goes, you moved that, that frame, didn't you? And I said, now how in the world would you notice that? <laughs> and he just walks out of the room. He's like, I'm a radiologist, bro. <laughs> I'm that's, like, that's right, because you notice these things. They're super observant. That are nice, so, that, have, are, that are different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I, that's something I would have never noticed. Dang, but, we're fine yeah. master, right? So right. just like that 8 by 10 frame, he's looking for lesions. But Reggie apparently is a lesion master. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Not on, on a certain level that's very much lower than the radiologist. Basically, um, it's a kind of a <laughs> just a quick example of what's the difference between MRI and CT. Basically, MRI specializes in soft tissue. Right. Yes. That said, we still look at bone. CT specializes in bone. That said, they still look at soft tissue. So that's right. kind of the difference. Right. And they use like a CT for uh, stroke alerts because it's fast. You know, but uh, they are doing strokes now in MRI. Oh, yeah, that's right. a lot of their angiograms are superior to MRI, according to radiologists. Right. Um, right. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, no, so. CTA is actually our, our apparently the superior option, um, especially for a patient where there's urgency. Right. Um, so. That's the thing. It's they're faster, Quick and too, some yeah. patients can't go into MRI, you know, for claustrophobia or they right. have some metal parts. So and actually okay. probably a good transition. So when patients come to you and they're due to have an MRI and they're getting their IV started and they say, I'm super anxious, are you able to offer them any kind of sedation? Um, not sedation, but um, we can offer them uh, Valium, you know, um, oh, so kind of some of our radiologists yeah. will okay. Um, is that five... facility to facility policy or is that? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. 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 I mean, so yes, some of our is. radiologists <laughs> will. Uh, there's places there's no way. And it some radiologists are question. not okay, okaying. Yeah, five they milligrams don't of oral Valium. Right, and liability is huge too. Exactly. Right? I mean, they don't know what medications this patient's on. They don't know if even if we say they have a driver, they don't know right. that this patient's going to go out and drive and kill somebody on the road. A lot of right. patients will say they have a driver just because they know if you say that they don't, exactly. we're going to send them home. So right. so a lot of people are not comfortable with saying, yeah, give them five of Valium, which it's not like a, you know, a serious narcotic, but... And I don't blame them, right. but a lot of times um, patients, their 
ordering provider, which I am very surprised, the ordering provider will say, oh, MRI will give you something or oh, MRI yeah, will. They say, we're well, going to give it to us. Well, yeah. MRI will put you under. Yeah. MRI. Oh, yeah. I've had that They'll do something. Times. Yeah. They'll, and I say, oh, did and, they? <laughs> and so they the, said that, did they? <laughs> the ordering well, providers name? need to be um, educated on what we can and cannot right. do. Right. So that. Um, amazes me too. Or also when they're allergic, they'll say, right. oh, MRI will give you something right. for your uh, gadolinium allergy. Right. No, 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 that's not true either. Exactly. So their ordering provider needs to be educated. So you know, a question I meant to ask you earlier when we were talking about reactions to contrast, is there any kind of translation? Like if you are more susceptible to being um, you know, allergic to one contrast, does that mean that you're more susceptible to being allergic to the other? Or are no, they completely not but there's related? some people that are just allergy. They're very Everything. sensitive. Yeah. You know, yeah. they come in and their allergy list is three pages long. Wow. Um, and they are just super sensitive to everything. They are just like a allergic person. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I am more concerned with them. They go, well, I've never had gadolinium, but, right. you know, anything causes them a uh, allergic reaction. And they hear so, the word contrast, and they just think it's all the same. Right. right? Yeah. No, but they're also very sensitive but to sensitive. everything. Right. So, right. yeah, so everything, anything it's can make them. It's good to be precautious. Yes. For sure. But then, but if they're alert, or a lot of people, oh, I love this one. My mother's allergic to gadolinium. Yeah, I get that. That, uh, that doesn't or mean we, What we get is my mom's my mom's neighbor is allergic to iodine. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I know. Sorry for your mom's neighbor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it doesn't. Right. And, and you know it's it doesn't matter. Contagious. No, it's not. So I say, you know, well, we can just try it. It's up to you. And I think if somebody is so anxious, right, they just might. I don't know. To work themselves up into a reaction, right? right? Like, yeah, because you're right. actually having a panic attack more so than a exactly. contrast reaction. Yeah, and that's kind of scary. And that's the other powerful. thing. Your mind is a powerful thing. Yeah. That's another thing is, you know, being claustrophobic. Oh, right. Uh, they, I love that we have essential oils and we have yeah. those. I love those little... Um, the sticky yeah, lavender yeah. ones. Aromatherapy. Aromatherapy strips, right? thing. Yeah. I, you know, I've been at our facility a long time and they would have poo-pooed aromatherapy years ago because right. that's that's not, you know, that's not that that doesn't work. Right. It's not now, in the Western medicine guide. That, no, right? no. <laughs> now, oh yeah, they embrace it because right. it's not a medication. It's not you can't get addicted. You right. can't it's something that they go, hey, if it works, use it. Right. And I try to, again, kind of prep patients. I go, this is, you're going to be laying in here. It's going to be noisy, clangy. The MRI techs are wonderful. They uh, will talk you through it. They'll put something over your eyes. Yes. They will be right there behind the glass. Right, so I exactly. think if they, if I prep them and kind of give them an idea of what to expect. Yes. Because the unknown is kind of scary, too. Yeah. Right? If I just go, oh, here, just stick the IV in and Wait let right them here. go. They'll come get you. Yeah. yeah. I think if I talk them off the ledge a little bit right. and I give them one of those aromatherapy, we have these little lavender aromatherapy things. And I said, do you like lavender, the smell of lavender? I give them one of those. I go, make believe you're on a beach or at the mountains. And I, I talk with them and they go, I feel so much better. Yeah. I oh, find gonna... for those patients, if you're just willing to give them a little bit extra of your time. Yes. And you're willing to kind of like validate their fears and right and, and if give you, them the extra time to educate them. It'll kind of wash away their anxiety. And help if they know them. you're at the other side of that glass mm -hmm. and that they just squeeze that ball, that little emergency ball that they know right. that you're going to be right there. Right there yep. I think a lot of it, they're better. Yeah. Right. But if they just go in there and you just like stick the IV in and go next. Right. It only escalates. And there's places fears. that do that. So we're we're fortunate enough that we work at a place that we're given the time slots that we can give that yeah. extra time. I, I think uh, Hollywood plays a big part in kind of the fear of yeah. MRI too. Well, Hollywood's completely because wrong. I know, uh, <laughs> there was an episode with House, and maybe we'll pull this up later. 
uh, or I'll, maybe I'll put it in the show notes if I can find the link, uh, where I think it's like LL Cool J or something was getting an MRI, and like the entire time, he's, he has nothing on him, and he's just like screaming and he's shaking, like, ah, because he had a tattoo that man oh. had like some old leg, you know, so he was screaming because he had all these tattoos on him. He's like, ah, and I'm like, in my head, I'm thinking, Mm, all that how, he's doing. I'm thinking, how old are those tattoos? Right. <laughs> it is. I'm thinking, why is Dr. House right here running the MRI scan? <laughs> right. Right. Not that that doesn't happen yeah. anywhere, but it's just very unlikely. You know, the doctors are very, uh, they're short staffed these days, so they're needed to do, you know, other things. So, <laughs> so very rare you see a doctor actually run a scanner, but it, it's just funny how Hollywood presents MRI and some right. imaging modalities as well. So it sounds like you get a lot of questions amongst other nurses within the hospital setting itself, but do you get questions from your friends and family just at home? Like, um, uh, no, well, no, I think there was uh, David and I were watching, um, um, was it the office and somebody had to have a, a um, MRI and, Michael, the character in the office, was trying to put his foot in the MRI when <laughs> Dwight was having oh, um, right. a head MRI. And it's like, that's not going to happen. You right. know? So, yeah. so, yeah. Like David's Hollywood, our producer. We found anyway. your problem. You got a foot in your head. Yeah, yeah that's not going to happen. So, I mean, Did we tell our audience who David and the connection is? So David's our producer. He's our young Jamie because we copied Joe Rogan blatantly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, David's mom is Eileen. So, yes. <laughs> So we work with both of them, actually. We like um, to keep it in the family. Yes. <laughs> so it was easier to book you that way. Yeah. We did put that guilt trip on Dave. <laughs> Thank you, by the way. Okay. Awesome. So um, we went over the differences between CT and MRI. You want to kind of skip to the next one? We actually, by the oh. way, Eileen, we did a whole oh. episode on the difference between CT and MRI because we get that question a lot. Oh, well. okay. Yeah, so there'll probably be a link in this so video. So for you eventually. viewers, yeah. if you like, wanna, we go into depth on that. Uh, look for that other video. I also get why does um, why does our facility not have an open oh, MRI? Oh, yeah. I'd love to answer this question. Yeah. So I go, they're not strong enough. Right. So this picture is a one and a half T, one and a half Tesla um, image. And mm -hmm. I actually tried to find, I know there's a 1.2 T MRI and there's one in the valley somewhere. I don't know where. Right. But our weakest uh, MRI is a one and a half T. Right. So even a 1.2 T is, you know, pretty strong. But I mean, our strongest MRI is a three T. So if I had an option between a 1.2 open MRI and a three T, I would go for the three T. Right. But just real quick. So when she says three T, that means three Tesla. Yeah. One Tesla is 10,000 Gauss. Your magnet on your refrigerator is about 50 gauss. All right. So we're looking 50 gauss versus 30,000 gauss. The, uh, I worked with the tech who uses this analogy. I love it. And I stole it from her, Donna. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the magnets that you stick at home onto your refrigerator? Well, the magnets that we use, you can stick a refrigerator to. Oh, right. <laughs> That's a good, I like that. I'm going to have to steal that. <laughs> it, it, it relates to your image quality big time, too, right? Like, the, the stronger your strength, the higher the resolution you can kind of get out of the pictures. The shorter your scan theoretically can be as well. So, uh, you know, it, you don't get the same bang for your buck. It's going to be that radiologist's job is going to be so much harder to get the diagnosis from an open MRI than from a traditional. And don't you need a closed system also? like a Yeah. So what I tell patients right. is it's counterproductive. So the whole reason, 100% right. of the reason why your doctor ordered MRI is because MRI is superior to other modalities as far as image quality. Right. But once you, you go from closed bore to open bore, you're now compromising that image quality so much so that it's kind of counterproductive. It's like, well, what are we even doing this anymore? Right. You know? Exactly. Right. You went from an A quality exam to a C quality. Well, they were looking for A quality. Right. You know? Right. So and that, they might miss something. I mean, when we're looking at, my, not microscopic, but, you know, we're looking at tiny little lesions. Yeah, that, exactly. So they could miss a tiny little lesion. And are you willing to compromise your diagnosis <laughs> right. based on your anxiety? I mean, we have things for that. We have oral sedation. We have, uh, we have anesthesia. Right. We have the time to spend with you to right. reassure you. But 
And, okay. I, and I love this picture. I mean, he looks so comfortable in <laughs> right. that open MRI there. <laughs> exactly. That looks like he's over it still, though. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> So. so even the open MRIs are deceiving. And by the way, that is true though, because MRIs like it's a board you go into. It looks like a, t a tunnel, so you go into it. Yeah, and it's right there in front of your face. Yeah, but a lot of times these open MRIs, they're like a sandwich. Exactly. So well, I call this a manwich. Right yeah. <laughs> so it's, like yeah, it. if you're truly anxious if yeah. you're truly claustrophobic, might as well just go with the yeah. traditional MRI. I mean, technology's changing, so we don't know how the technology might progress in the future. Uh, but the way things I've seen are still moving towards the closed system, the the donut bore magnets, right. and I mean, they're, they're getting down to like the nanoscale on um, when they can compare different tissue regions. Like it's it's amazing right. it's how that's moving. So don't don't cost yourself a diagnosis because of your fears. You right, know? give what you came for. You know, um, and I will go, we'll definitely cover your PowerPoint here too. We can skip to the next slide if you want. Yeah. But one thing I did want to cover in the world of MR, or, uh, radiology nursing, I would, one thing I would imagine you deal with a lot is infiltration or extravasation. Oh, yeah, look at yeah. that. Yeah, so with that, um, and, and yeah, it's obviously related. But um, what would you say that you guys kind of deal with the most between the two modalities, CT and MRI? Where do you see it the most? Because I imagine Infiltrations? Mm -hmm. CT. And is it has to do with the mass, the volume of the which you're injecting? Yep. Oh, yes, because we'll inject uh, two, keep going to my glasses, 250 um, cc's into, you know, an arm. Oh. And uh, because we inject so fast and um, a lot of times the patients don't even feel it. Right. You know, especially if like... they're a little on the fluffy side. Right. Um, it goes in within just um, you know, sixty seconds. And then they get that warm feeling, right? They get that it's warm much. feeling and right. they think, oh, this is just the the the, the normal feeling. Right. So they don't even know. Right. So um and so we deal with a lot of infiltrations. And on the MRI side, um, MRI only injects yeah. 10, 15 yeah. cc's, which is just tablespoons <laughs> amount of fluid. Right. So it's not, you don't notice it as much. For sure. And For uh, sure. just if you don't mind, David, will you pull up a, a picture of, uh, just type in extravasation and go to images? Yeah, because it's VT. And if you would, Eileen, just kind of I do have describe a picture of what an infiltration and extravasation is. I do have is. a picture oh, do you? Oh, on perfect. my slide of a, a, it's actually of a child at the, uh, towards the end of what a extravasation uh, looks it's like. It's the next one, the yellow one. Sorry for kind of going out of order, Eileen. Oh, that's okay. I didn't realize you were going to cover that. So Ooh. this is a Ouch. Uh, a child that um, a contrast extravasated in the hand, and then it's a image uh, of the hand, and then the middle picture is a um, it's called a fasciotomy. Yeah. It's so what happens when fluid is uh, extravasated into a small space? It um, cuts off. It's like kind of like a carpal tunnel, like you don't have enough space for the nerve to move. Oh, right, right, so right. they've got to release the space that pressure, yeah. so that you don't cut off the nerve. Right. So that you don't have damage. So but they do a fasciotomy. And so they fillet open your arm. Wow. And this one's a pretty neat looking one. Usually yeah. they do a zigzag pattern. I don't know why, oh, but this is a uh, neat looking one. And then they sew it back up. And so sorry ahead. to interrupt, but if you could just kind of define what extravasation is, because I imagine there are people lost okay. right now. So um, in the slides before, it kind of explains yep. it. Go ahead. So, you can kind of... so if we, if we want to go back, I'll kind of explain like, um, so um, go Keep back going. another one. So David. if the IV is not inside the vein, if the IV is just kind of just 
sitting just inside the vein and then the patient puts their arms above the, their head and then we're power injecting and power Ooh. injecting we use a very high pressure power injection to get the contrast in All at right. a very high pressure so that we can scan and inject really fast at the same time for right. our cat scan pi pictures a lot of um, protocols deal with the timings and everything. So you got to have the timing. Yes, the, timing. So yeah. that little catheter can back out of the vein and then infuse the con infuse the contrast into the surrounding tissue right and wow. instead of into the vein. Ooh. So instead of going inside the vein, it goes into the surrounding tissue and it just swells up at the tissue instead of going into the into the venous system because ct can have sometimes like 250 like 250 cc's, and, cc's is, yeah. which is a cup of fluid and that all can go in stuff Ooh, so it's yep. just like popeye muscle right there huh? yep wow yep a cup of fluid all into a tiny space I've, yep. I've actually never seen uh like a true um that's, yeah, one of these before. Wow. So, yeah. what was it called? Fasciotomy, you said, for that, that pediatric patient? That is that something that's common for extravasation? Or that, I would imagine. Yeah, that. they do a lot of fasciotomies. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. So, but for an outpatient setting, if you had a patient who was presented with extravasation, that wouldn't be your first step. No, right? no. So, what we do is we elevate the arm. Okay. Mm -hmm. We first put, um, we first put, um, ice packs on it for pain and then we'll put heat packs on it but elevation is the best thing to try to like well first we'll try to um Pull. suck it out right is, you know see if we can suck any of it out manually yeah. we'll put keep the iv catheter in and see put a syringe on it and see if we can see. um yeah again. aspirate some of it out doesn't usually happen because it's in the tissues right. you know it's not like in a vessel so right we don't usually no get vacuum, much out so diffused by that point yeah, yeah. Right. so then we'll elevate the limb then put some uh, ice on it everybody's got like a idea of what to put on it some put um ice some put heat but i think ice at first if it's painful you know kind of ice it Stricks, and yeah. then heat to kind of help it diffuse you see i guess my question has always been why isn't that definitive as far as hot or cool because everybody's got an opinion okay right so but i think heat to make it diffuse right you know and yeah. absorb so your body's going to absorb it but if it's uh, a lot of pressure and you're going to cut off the nerve then fasciotomy is the way to go. Mm. So that's why for CT, I never go like in the four. lower arm. Uh, I always go up here. Nice. And so that's what up years in of the upper uh, arm. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that a nurse with 15 years of experience in radiology would do. So right. that's, so that's why your value, your, what your experience is so valuable to these new nurses coming in. Right. And that's supposed because, you know, you got more tissue, more tissue here. Right. right? Yeah. So, and you know, and, and then the, the type of IV, um, what we do too. So a lot, why I kind of developed this was to, to kind of explain if you have a short IV and you're going to a deeper vein and you only get the tip of that catheter into that vein mm -hmm. and then you put a power injector and what, how much PSI is on oh. your power injector? Yeah, it can easily go up to... I don't even know. I've, the highest I've seen it goes. I think 200? I have. I think I had on my PowerPoint. Oh yeah. What your PSI? What because the PSI is, yeah, right? yeah. Um, I had um that, that one with the injector. Yeah. Go back. The other way, I think. Yeah, keep going back. So yeah, so this was I wanted to oh, nice. explain what um, power injectors and I wanted to give a little kind of, especially for nursing. Yeah. So what we did, so that on the left is a little kind of IV pump. Mm -hmm. And if you put that up to the fastest it would go would be 999. So that's a, a liter of fluid in mm. one hour. Okay. So 250 uh, cc's of fluid, which is a cup in right. 15 minutes, that would be the fastest it would go. That would be at 36 PSI, right? Right. CT power injector, we would inject 
250 cc's of uh, fluid in 60 seconds at 200 PSI, Ooh. at least 200 PSI. Ooh. So MRI, we usually inject, you know, mm. 10, 15 cc's. Right. And I think in my notes, it might've had uh, what the uh, PSI for MRI, because I did find out what the MRI PSI like was. 300 PSI, 260, 280? I mean, the, the maximum the max. you can go. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so probably an ACR this would be like a good idea of what, this would be if you could want to put your uh, the yeah. fire department with PSI. So we're injecting, you know, um, the PSI at 200 yeah. PSI. You can go up to a very high PSI, but this is what this is only 100 PSI with the fire hose. Wow. And for people watching or just listening, I'm just going to kind of explain. So it's just pretty much uh, looks like firemen in training, and they are. It looks like the water hose is actually spraying a lot of water going at 100 psi, and they're trying to bring it in. I guess just trying to they're trying to tame catch it, it. Catch trying it. to take control of it. Yeah. And these men, I assume they're men, are being wished around yeah, they, by these fire hoses. They don't have a chance. <laughs> and that's just an example of 100 psi. So you said we're injecting at 200. That's why you're saying that it's important that the IV catheter advance far enough into the vein. That right. at least half of the catheter length is inside and, the vein. Yes. Yeah. And I did want to kind of go over IVs and different sizes and the reasons for them because there are different sizes as far as the length of the IV catheter. Yep. And, also, and, and also different IVs. And there was uh, one of my PowerPoints if you want to go. Perfect. Uh, back to you gotta go nope, keep back. Going back and what you guys keep going one yeah this um iv i uh, i don't know if you guys ever oh, yeah, see the these diffusics yeah. and i love this um this diffusic and i'm kind of plugging these people so that's the number on on the cap there it's the max <laughs> the, that you can, can so a 22 gauge on a regular iv and a regular uh iv gauge a regular iv a 22 you can go like maybe two or three cc's a second right this on a 22 gauge on this brand iv you can go up to six and a half cc's a second wow. up to 325 psi so they changed the technology somehow. Right? Yes. Wow. So and so why they can do that at the end of these catheters, not only wow. is there just one hole at the end of the plastic catheter, there's holes at the sides of the catheter. Wow. And the little butterfly wings at the end, it's not for the old butterflies to oh, hold yeah. onto yeah. them. It's for stabilization. So when Anchor you it, kind of. inject at that high pressure, when you have it taped down, it's not uh, going to back out. That's nice. So the, what this means for patients who hate needles is that you don't have to use like the right. big needles anymore. And so when I inject, when I start IVs for MRI, you may right. see me use a 24 gauge diffusic. That's funny because I, <laughs> whenever you I might see go, those, I don't like those personally. Yeah. You don't? <laughs> well, because well, some some nurses will put a hub at the end and some won't, and you get that retro flow. Um, and so unless it's capped off when you go to you know flush it just before then you get that retro flow there's no negative pressure yeah, yeah. so why i oh, use a 24 gauge you can go up to three cc's a second nice yeah. so you guys Dang, that's like using a baby needle to to do what uh 18 gauge used to do or 22 yes. gauge used to do. yeah Oh, wow. So that's why for I'm MRI, to understand why you guys use those. I will use a 24 gauge, this diffusic IV uh, yeah. in your department. Yeah, because sometimes, I, and I've been stuck with a 24 gauge, and sometimes you can't even fill it. And well, they're that small. That's so, nice. And I love these. Yeah. This that's little, why I love them. That technology, that's amazing. So they just It's a little sure different hold. technique to start them. Oh. But it is, it is a really good IV to use. And uh, the next slide you'll see it inside the vein. So you'll see it. Oh, and then the smaller the nice. number gauge, the bigger around it is in diameter. So the smaller it is, the more it's going to hurt. <laughs> Have you noticed any trends with like um, just veins blowing or suffocations, anything like that with these versus the old ones or pretty much kind of the same? It depends on who you talk to. Oh, okay. So, well. Some people blame the needle. Uh, some nurses do not like 
these IVs because they it, it's a little different technique to start them, so they're not starting them correctly. So uh -huh. they're blowing more of so them. Comfort level, mostly. comfort level, yeah. and then CT claims they're not performing the way that the manufacturer says that they're they can perform. So, mm. so to get so if you go back to the uh, mm. that one, it says a twenty gauge should be able to inject at 10 cc's a second with a power injector up to 325 psi right they're saying that it's that's not that's not happening uh, but. okay well i can imagine if you added more holes it would slow the pressure down right on the way out so you have to push it faster yeah. to get that no it pressure? should or it should be the same it yeah. should be able to go <laughs> faster with more holes right that's true and so. i'm trying to think in mri yeah. I think the fastest yeah. rate that we do is three cc's yeah, per maybe second. Four, yeah. You do four cc's on what it's, exam? With perfusions, brain perfusions. Those are four? four. Well, we would, then would we don't know that. Then why do you just say, okay, I did not know that. Yes. And um, I don't know if it's been that way the whole time. And some people do go three on them. But I know there's a research, they, uh, one of the, like, the glioma researchers for sure, I'm pretty sure it goes four. I might be wrong on that though. I've been off my game lately. Okay. But either way, <laughs> Let you're, me know. you're definitely, definitely within know. that window of allowance. So it right. looks like, you know, you're up to 10 cc. So there's no concern there. You're saying, although it claims that it might not be that, but even so you're going to at least be safe with when you're injecting the three cc's. What does CT usually do? Do you know at their highest rate? Uh, they have some exams that are eight cc's a second. Really? So we put two IVs in. Okay. So. And you do that just in case one blows and you have access? No. They do uh, five. They do four cc's in each IV. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because yeah. Now, as a nurse, what's the average size IV? So you're not in radiology or anything, but when a patient comes into the hospital, what's the average size IV that they just put in? Um, is there just like a standard? in radiology? No, no, no. Saying that if the patient well, ER got, is, yeah. is different than. Oh, uh, so yeah, it just yeah, so different. facility to facility, I yeah. think probably right as well. Probably so. 20 uh, gauge is probably the most common IV, common. I would say. And uh, I would say, personally, 99% of the IVs that I've started are 22. Right. For MRI, 22. Right. That's, yeah. Okay. Because so. that's what you need. All right. So what else? Uh, let's see. That's the diffuser. One question that I had for you, Eileen, is because a little bit of research that I was doing before you came was, what's the difference between infiltration and extravasation? extravasation. So infiltration is like um, saline or Ringer's lactate. Extravasation is contrast. Okay. Is oh. my okay. So it's the, the unit or the okay. Okay. I believe. Oh, uh, because of how the body kind of absorbs it, or I don't know. Yeah. So then I, I put this in uh, because the power uh, port needles. Oh, and yeah. I don't know if this, well, it should mean for you also that when we uh, use a power port needle, um, the little Y port on the side on the left should have a dead end cap on it and not a flow cap. If you hit the uh, hit it again and have that little uh, blue flow cap at the that should not that little flow cap at the um, oh, yeah. end should not be on the Y port on the side because when you power inject, it can back out the flow cap on the Y port on, on the, the side. Port. It should have a dead end cap. Of the pressure, or the pressure. Like even with the clamps, it's it's the weirdest thing. For CT, we have found even if you clamp off the end and go through the Y port, it still backs up through the clamp. Oh, so when so. a patient's presented to you with a port and you need to access it, what are the steps to do? Oh that? wow, is that so easier we, than uh, IVs? Uh, no, Just because we are reference. extremely picky with our power injectable oh, ports. Right. So we have to make sure first that they're power injectable. We have to make sure that... And you do uh, that by checking the model number or something? And the patient no, we has have a card to... Uh, they have a card. We have to look at uh, the uh, chest uh, image. Right. We have to make sure that the tip 
is the oh. tip of the catheter is in the correct place, meaning... So you're looking at a radiograph next Yes, right. radiograph. Nice. That the tip is in the SVC right. or in the right atrium, somewhere in the right atrium. And then we have to make sure that there is blood return. Uh, if mm. we do not have blood return, uh, we cannot use it. And a lot of patients say, oh, I never have blood return. They still use it. Right. We cannot use uh, a power port power unless port. we have blood return. Mm. So, um, and it's, I, I keep a, a little kind of uh, my own little um, images of funky ports. <laughs> I've seen some ports where the tip has migrated up into the carotid artery. Oh. So you know you don't want it. It just does that from flow. It just uh, migrates, and it was a young guy. Oh wow! How long do you have his in for? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Okay. But uh, you definitely don't want to power inject two fifty of contrast into his brain. Oh my gosh! So uh, I see. um, (laughs) You know, we've had ports that have migrated through the wall. So yeah, they go. Yeah, we. Oh, we had a port that migrated through the chest wall into somebody's lungs, and they were infusing TPA into his lungs. Oh, wow. So then, yeah, the patient was an inpatient, and they were coming down for, um, they were coming down for thoracentesis. So we were so, sucking out. And TPA is what you would give for a stroke patient, right? No, no, oh, oh not TPA, TPN. I'm sorry. TPN. Okay. TPN. So that's total parenteral nutrition, which uh, is somebody that can't oh, geez. eat. Yeah, so they were getting TPN through their, their port and it was infusing right into their chest because they weren't checking for blood return. Thanks. That's pretty important. Yes. Yeah. So is there anything after, for, as far as the tech goes that we need to be doing to treat it differently than an IV? Like for example, I've worked at a facility that you would flush it with heparin saline. So um, right now we're not flushing anything with heparin anymore. Okay. Mm. So, but we, you have to make sure um, also you, also want to scrub the hub for oh. 15 seconds. Right. You really want to make sure you are scrubbing the hub for 15 seconds at least. Yeah. You, with alcohol. With alcohol, yeah. yes. And even if it has one of those alcohol caps oh, yeah, on it, yeah. you take that off, you scrub the hub for 15 seconds. Right. You want to make sure um, you've got really good blood return. You want to then flush it really well um, with uh, saline. Uh, if you, uh, some of the picks we have, um, I don't know if you've seen the uh, pick they're called solo picks. Oh. They have a little different, um, um, like, a little confi- different configuration. They have like a little bulbous kind of end. Uh-huh. It's because they have the valve is at is in a different place, so they don't get kind of a reflux. Uh-huh. So sometimes getting blood return on them is a little more difficult. So it's a pause, pull, pause, pull. Uh. Pause, pull, and then you'll get the blood return, and the same thing with push. When you're flashing, push, uh, push, pause, push, pause. Uh, But you want to be extremely careful when accessing and flushing them because you do not want to introduce any infection. Right. In those, and that's the number one concern, right? It would be an infection, and that's the reason why you would make sure to wash it for 15 seconds and stuff, and take extra precautions because you're getting direct access. Yes. Right. That's direct access. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. And so that, what's my next? And one? Is, would you take the same precautions you said for that port? You would a pick or a central line or something like that as well. Oh yeah, all okay. ports picks are all central lines. Okay. Hey. You know how many takes it took me to get that picture? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> what I'm seeing is a little graininess. <laughs> and, you cl- and you clip the right uh, angle there, the contraphenic <laughs> angle. Yeah, I photobombed the chest x oh, yeah. <laughs> That'd be funny. <laughs> No nurses with harm to making this podcast. <laughs> well, there's a million questions we could ask. I mean, you got years of experience. Is there anything you can think of, Reggie? Yeah, no. I don't know. That's a good question. One thing we do like to ask all of our guests, and we'll, co- we'll ask it now. Yeah. It, what would you say is the most satisfying or most fulfilling moment you've had in your healthcare career so far? Yeah. 
Um, I love doing IVs. And one of the pictures was uh, ultrasound IVs. I oh, do yes. uh, ultrasound IVs. I, we used to have right. this tiny right. little uh, ultrasound. Um, it was, I used to call it the transistor radio of that little thing. Oh, okay. um, why is it that you would need an ultrasound to start an IV? Uh, some, we have a, a lot of challenging IVs. Just kind of help on um, the vein and stuff. Yeah. So instead of poking, 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 and uh, you know, missing, uh, we have a lot of um, you know, fluffy patients that have a little deeper veins. Oh, nice. Yeah. So you because even me too, because I'm a pretty skinny guy, but my veins roll, and they uh, I always used to get. Uh, and when a patient says pulse. that a veins roll, what does that mean? Because you hear that a lot. I think right? sometimes it's a excuse for poor technique. Ah. Uh. <laughs> so I think it's just somebody's just, excuse. They're hustling me. But little. one thing that I always tell people, and I'm pointing at you, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, I'm all ears. Um, I, when I teach, I, I like to teach people how to do IVs. Mm -hmm. And I say, do not go by the IV, the vein that you can see. Go by the vein that you can feel ah. because you're not going to see it on dark skinned people. You're not yeah. going to yep. see it on people so with, with uh, tattoo sleeves all yep. over the place. You're not going to see it necessarily on a fluffy person that has a deeper vein. Right. You're not going to see. So do not go by the ones that you can see. Go by the ones that you feel. Yeah. And you want to really feel that bouncy, bouncy vein. Oh, almost spongy. Huh? And yeah. you want to follow that vein and get a really good feel. Nice. And I have a lot. Lot of I, I really enjoy um, IVs and teaching IVs. That nice. is my that's really, thing. Oh, that's awesome! So, and by the way, I love starting IVs too. So I, I so I steal them from you. <laughs> the what? I steal them from you sometimes. Good. Oh, I'm glad because not all of them are or CT. All oh, right, and not all it nurses are art. glad when I do. It's it's an art. To, really? Uh, yeah. To, to kind of it be really good art. at that yes. because and it's a it's a skill that you can lose. So right. I try to. I, I, it's but something I genuinely enjoy doing. So, and I can give you some some tips and techniques I that I have tips learned and techniques over for sure. the years. All right. You know, I I, I don't like when I see patient uh, nurses oh, hitting oh and flicking and hitting. I, I, I wouldn't like that on me. Right. Somebody. Because what is that they're trying to do anyway? They want to like, bring that vein up and kind of. Inflame uh, it? Or? Inflame it. Right. Okay. But I think what I do, I know we have our little kit, kits with the chlorhexidine little oh, wipes, yeah, yeah. but I take alcohol wipes and I wipe it uh, to, just, just to kinda... bring it up. And then I use the chlorhexidine. So the wiping oh. does the same thing. Oh, it's nice. Instead yeah. of flicking. And, and like. <laughs> uh, sometimes I use two. Um, Two tourniquets. Oh, nice. A little tighter little and snugger. High. Nice. That's another technique. I use blood pressure cuffs too, but you guys can't really use a blood pressure cuff yeah. inside. Right. And a blood pressure cuff is a really good technique. I ought to, to get use. the veins really popping out. Yeah. Dang, we should get a starter kit in here one of these days. Well, I did want to kind of cover like tips and tricks as, as far as the patient perspectives and the person starting the IV. So one thing that we would recommend for patients who are coming in to have an IV start, especially if you're known to be a tough stick, if there's no restrictions and you're not meant to have labs and there's no reason for MPO, then drink plenty of fluids. Oh, make sure you're hydrated. Drink. That's probably the best thing you can do. Make sure you're hydrated. Right. Yeah. But we do have little tricks of the trade. And one of them are, is like these things called... Uh, I've got the name for it. I want to make sure I get it right. Let me find that. But these these vein finders. Oh, right? yeah. They use UV light or something, right? Yeah, they're pretty cool, actually. But when I've talked to people who like phlebotomists and stuff, people who do this all day, every day, they don't really, they're not sold on it. But they're these vein visuals, visualizations are also known as vein illuminations. But check this out. It's a 32-second video. Oh, that's interesting. So the veins are dark. And areas. I've seen this, yeah. And it's like they're just a bright person. UV light they're putting across this person's and arm. it looks as cool as it, I mean, this is, it's pretty cool, man. And you can use it on like someone that's darker skin too? Honestly, I would that's imagine it? so, but right. I don't know. It's interesting. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I've never used one. They have ones with, you know, like little lights. You can just see it. No, you don't see it. You see that? It's crazy. But yeah. like you, Eileen, I, I basically, I... Really, cool. uh, I guess. What am I? What, I you like being invasive? Just say it. Ah! <laughs> well, no, I I'm really still trying to get the guy out of my house, and you know, uh, I really <laughs> lean on palpating and overseeing, and so I kind of I have to be able to feel it versus see it. And that what they're showing you there is a person who can't feel it, 
and they can't right. see it. Oh, and so now right. they only can use visual right. aids too. Oh, that's true. And I really, really that need happens. to be able to feel it. So when I personally started an IV is first thing I do is I, I try to find it the vein mm -hmm. i try to make sure that it's not close to an artery i try to feel where it's coming from and where it's going the uh -huh. direction see how sclerotic it is see if it's going to be one that rolls on me if so then i'll ank anchor it more anchoring it That's that good. is the key right is that just so tugging the skin more then no you, so you want you're to anchor, gonna, anchor it anchoring distally. is here like you know you're just going say this is one here you're just going to hold it oh. so that when you poke it it's right. not going to run away from you so if you're just going to go like this it, uh, it, and if you so have you, a sclerotic vein that's when it's going to run away too if uh, you're if you have a vein here that you have mm -hmm. given blood you know mm -hmm. 50 times uh, that little scar tissue you have a lot of scar tissue there. it just might run away uh, so but anchoring anchoring it, Yes. Yeah, and especially like for patients who are former IV drug abusers and stuff like that. Yeah. That's something you see a lot with the scar tissue. So uh, chemo patients. Chemo. Yeah, chemo patients. We have a yeah. lot of chemo patients right. and IV drug abusers. Yeah. So there's a lot of tricks and trades, but one one trick that I would say to start an IV is you want to go, really want to visualize going in as parallel as possible to the vein itself. So mm -hmm. don't come at a steep angle if you're coming like this. No. You kind of want to come like this. Well, yep. you're going to be going this direction, but uh, exactly. So keep in mind the angle of which the vein comes and goes, and you want to kind of go along with that. And you want to go parallel with the the vein itself as as much so as you can. I saw you switch the hub, so the flow obviously. Well, you want to go this direction. With the arm. Yeah. So what happens if you went the other way? Well, that well, supply is. You would get retrograde. Right, well, if flow you go, back, right? If you go so you're the going against way. the flow. Yeah. Right. I mean, I guess if you're going, I don't know. I've never done, started an artery. I've never accessed an artery. If you were doing an artery, you'd probably go that way, would you? Well, if you access it. Well, uh, well, I'm saying if you access an artery, you say in the arm by mistake, you yeah. know it. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've never done that. It's, it's a bad day. I've never done that. <laughs> it happens. But what it, it's actually, let's cover that though. What would be a good way to kind of. Uh, QA whether or not you've done that. So when you've done it, when you've done it, dumping. Um, so your the blood comes back right uh, right away, and it comes back uh, bright red as oh. opposed as a little um, darker. So arterial blood is brighter is bright than red. venous blood. Um, it also comes it back as a pressure. Right. Um, Does it pulsate? It pulsates. So when you're feeling it, that's how you know you're on an artery, huh? It's just feeling yeah. the pulsation. But I have had some patients where, especially when I look with ultrasound, where their artery is more center, like, medial, which is weird because uh -huh. your artery is usually like on, lateral, right? lateral right. on the side. Um, but it is, yeah, so it is weird when you see an artery that's in a weird spot. Right. right. Um, but when you do start it in an artery, by mistake, you should take it out and you need to hold pressure directly on that artery mm -hmm. for at least 10 minutes. Wow. Okay. Nice. And successful venipuncture into a venous after the exam itself, you've given the contrast. Now you're ready to take the IV out. Is there any kind of instructions that you should give a patient? How long it should be on for? Right. I always tell the for? patient, leave it on a half hour, 45 minutes. It's because a lot of our patients are on blood thinners and aspirin is still a blood thinner. So, right. Right. Um, you know, I put on, we use Coban, which is a wonderful um, bandage because right. I think it's great. I just um, found out they don't use latex in Coban anymore. The what? I, I thought there was some kind of latex in COVID for the longest, but I guess they no, there's latex no latex no. in that. Um, oh, yeah, that's amazing. Which is good because there's a lot of patients with latex allergies. Right. right. So I thought that was awesome. So we use uh, Coban, which is a, except in the lab, they do not use Coban, uh, which, because they would go through millions of dollars. Jamie, put a line for just example what Coban looks like. Is it? Uh, but I do like the Coban. So I'll tell them to put it on for about um, half hour, 45 minutes. Right. I always uh, put my finger over the spot, even with the Coban on, and I'll hold it for 
30 seconds. I always tell them, I said, I'm not on blood thinners, but I always put my uh, finger over the spot when I have my labs drawn. Right. It prevents that uh, little black and blue that uh, always happens, you know, when you I have always, your labs drawn. Right. I always tell them when the lab, um, you know, when they... Uh, patients have their labs drawn and they get that big black and blue it's usually because they draw the labs they put that gauze over and then they put that white uh curlex around uh, it yeah. and then the patient leaves the lab they bend their arm the curlex goes up an inch yeah so now it works like a tourniquet <laughs> so now they get a little pulling. blood leaking out underneath yeah. so now they have that bruise <laughs> so what they should do is just hold that spot for at least a minute like a you minute, know right. when they leave the lab right. and i always educate the patients nice you know and then as far as the exam itself we just gave you contrast so we always kind of not, not really related to the iv but just what we do is we ask that you drink plenty of fluids after the exam yes. right so flush your system. Wash it out. i always yeah. tell them it's in your bladder already um you know they i always tell them beforehand if they've never had the contrast itching sneezing trouble breathing those would be some signs of allergic reaction mm -hmm. i said 90 percent of the time patients are doing that right on the table that's how fast it happens right. i said um you know some patients will will um, say, you know, does it happen days later? I said, it's usually not from the contrast. It's usually from something else because the contrast is long out of their system. Right. You know, days later. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, unless right. they have some kind of kidney issue, right. I guess. But. Right. And like Eileen touched on earlier, with MRI, I can speak about that. Uh, it's a less than 1% reaction rate. And for those who do have a reaction, the most common symptom would be actually uh, headaches. Um, well, we see hives a lot too, but as far as like afterwards, you leave the department, um, you know, symptoms that come show up later, but and I, what, wouldn't what call that an I wouldn't call that an allergic reaction. I would call that an intolerance, yeah, more okay. of an allergic reaction. That's a good point. Yeah. And then what was your reaction rate for CT? Was it 3%? 3% of the population has an allergic reaction, has a allergy to allergy. iodine. Nice. Yeah, so there's a big discrepancy there. Yeah, nice. And that's still not very high. Yeah, for iodine, you would think no. it would be higher than that. Yeah, yeah. right. So, and no, for sure. to um, it also is a big difference the iodine we have today than we had 30, 40 years ago. Mm. Iodine 30, 40 years ago was a strong iodine. Oof. Patients stopped breathing. They broke out in hives. 30, 40 years ago. The iodine we have today is non-ionic contrast. Nice. It's a lot different than what we had 30, 40 Th years ago. Oh, that's awesome. So it's 3% of the not that people are allergic to the non-ionic <laughs> contrast. Nice. 30, 40 years ago, the iodine, it was a lot higher percent of people that were allergic to it. And I don't know what the percentage is, but a lot higher. Huh? They were, oh Ooh, yeah. Too frequent. And it shut down your kidneys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a well, scary spot. Yeah. And I imagine CT is the same way, but with MRI, there's different contrast agents. Like gadolinium is what we use, but there's different brands of gadolinium, just like soda. There's different brands. Right. I think with CT, they even break it down into like this vascularities, like uh, how vascular oh, it is. Yes. Yeah. So the yeah. different brands have yes. different ionic bonds. Yes. They have different reaction rates. Yeah. Correct. Yes. We have 350. We would love to bring somebody yeah. in to kind of talk about that. So, yeah. Um, is there anything else? We kind of covered a lot. Yeah. Thank you for coming. This is amazing. It was good. Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. Thank you. It was I great. Really yeah. Appreciate it. I feel like there's a million questions out there. And if you guys have any more questions, feel free to ask them. We would love to have Eileen uh, to come back. Yeah. Any excuse to bring her back. We would love for that. sure. Um, and keep your eye out on uh, any job posting for radiology nursing. Because it sounds like a pretty sweet gig. It right? is. <laughs> so, well, thank you for having me. Thank you, Eileen, for coming. Um, and thank you guys for watching. We've got other videos we're trying to post soon, so look out for those. But um, in the meantime, keep watching us. We appreciate you. We're, the, we're Reggie and Robert, the MRI guys. Yeah. We've got Eileen, so we've got the crew, and we've got Dave behind the camera. So thank you again for watching. This is Zone 3 Podcast. If there's anything else, can you think of anything? In the world MRI. I don't know. Have I a guess good night. we're out. Thank yeah. you for watching. Bye, Bye. everybody.